In a certain pond, there was a frog and two ducks that lived together, played together, enjoyed their summers together. They were the best of friends, and all summer long, they got to know each other pretty well. With the temperatures beginning to drop and the uh, coming of autumn, the ducks realized that it would be time for them to move on. They would have to fly to another pond. Now, this would be easy for the ducks, of course, but what about their friend, Mr. Frog? What was going to happen to him? Well, it was decided, finally, that the ducks would put a stick into each of their bills, and the frog would hang onto the stick by its mouth. And, of course, the ducks would fly the frog to the pond, this other pond with them. And that's what they did. So there they are. They're flying in the air. And just then a farmer looked up and he said to his wife, What a great idea. I wonder who thought of that. And proudly the frog said, I did! <laughs> yeah. Proverbs chapter... <laughs> Thank you for that. Proverbs 16... <laughs> Proverbs 16, 18 says, it's in, your, in the top of your message notes there, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Poor Mr. Frog found that out the hard way. <laughs> pride may be the one thing that gets us into trouble the most. You ever think about that? It's pride that saves face. It's pride that kind of leads us down the road. One day Jesus is having supper in the home of a Pharisee. And uh, guests start to arrive, and Jesus notices something about these guests. It's their pride. Their pride kind of gets in the way, and they're picking the most prominent places at the table to sit. Now, back then, that was the custom. Everyone had a place uh, to sit at the table, and they knew his or her place at the table. But the Pharisees, the guests showing up, We're taking this to another level. So here's what Jesus does. He tells a parable like he always does in Luke chapter 14. Follow along with me on the screen. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, Jesus says, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. And verse 11 is is the crux of the whole thing. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now here's Jesus once again. He kind of turns our thinking upside down, because in today's world, if you want to climb uh, higher and be somebody, then you got to kick and claw and scream and yell and, and push and shove your way to the top. And so we pat our resumes, we brown nose the boss at work, we get noticed or we try to get noticed in everything we do, the good stuff we do. And our thinking is the way up is up. If I elevate myself to a certain position, then I will keep climbing higher and higher. But Jesus says the way up is down. And our thinking goes, huh? The way up is down. If you try to promote yourself and pump yourself with pride, Jesus says you're going to end up humbled. You're going to end up humiliated. And it's not going to be good for you. James chapter 4, verse 10 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will do what? Lift you up. Humble yourselves before. The way up is down. The way up is down. Well, I want to talk about two problems for pride, of pride for a moment, and uh, write these in your notes. It wasn't just a problem in Jesus' day, this problem of pride. Pride is what helps us save face. Pride is what keeps us from exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. Pride gets in the way of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so it's this pride thing. There are a couple problems with it. And the first one is this. Write this in your notes. It's difficult to recognize it in yourself. Ouch. It is. It's really hard to recognize pride within yourself. Someone once said that pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick except the one who has it. Very true. In the Catholic list of the seven deadly sins, you've heard of that, I'm sure, pride used to be called, does anybody know? Well, uh, another name for pride, vanity. Vanity. Pride used to be called vanity in the the seven deadly sins. What's interesting is the Dutch painter Bosch 
depicted vanity as a woman looking into a mirror, but held by the devil. Isn't that interesting? We can see pride and vanity in other people, but when it comes to us, we're blind to it. We don't see it in ourselves. And that's pride. How many of you remember the song uh, by Carly Simon, You're So Vain? Oh, yeah, we got some takers. Good, good. You, you probably know the lyrics. Then. My wife loves this song. It's so funny when it comes on the radio. She's singing at the top of her lungs. Don't you, don't you. Oh, I don't like the song, but it's very fitting for today. Carly Simon never really revealed about whom she was talking in the lyrics. However, she dated Warren Beatty. Remember that? Warren Beatty is the guy who dumped her. And when Warren Beatty heard the song for the first time, you know what he did? He called her up on the phone and thanked her for writing the song about him. (laughs) Here, Here are the lyrics. You walked into the party like you were walking onto a yacht. Your your hat was strategically dipped below one eye. Your scarf, it was apricot. You had one eye in the mirror as you watched yourself gavot. Now that's French for a dancer who prances around haughtily. And then then she says, all the girls dreamed that they'd be your partner, they'd be your partner, and, everybody, you're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. And then she goes on, don't you, don't you, don't you, don't you, and and that's the lyrics. Some of you are so vain this morning, you think this message is about you, don't you? (laughs) And if you don't think it's about you, it probably is. Thank you. There you go. (laughs) My brother Jason, everybody. Uh, Good times, good times. Now, the problem with pride is that it's so difficult to recognize it within yourself. It is so difficult. So I've given you an assessment. Right there in your message notes, I've given you an assessment to take a PQ test, if you will, pride quotient test. Uh, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. I want you to go through it real quick. Just check the box that describes you. I enjoy being the center of attention. I think I deserve the best. Much of my cons- Go ahead and take that. I'll give you about 30 seconds. Go now. <laughs> Some of you are checking all of them, right? <laughs> I probably had, had a, I should have had your neighbor fill this out for you. <laughs> Switch, yeah. Uh, it's eye-opening, isn't it? If you really think about it. We don't see pride within ourselves, and, uh, 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 and that's, it's tough. How do you correct that? Here's the second problem with pride. Write this in your notes. It leads to ruin. We already talked about this with the frog. He found out the hard way. Pride leads to ruin. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, we can go way back to the beginning of time, before the earth was created, actually. And we, we knew a guy, we know a guy named Lucifer, who had it all. Lucifer had it all. He was, he was more gorgeous than the, than the latest GQ model. He, he was uh, probably second in command, if you will, next to God. He was the greatest leader in the entire universe. But pride led to his destruction. You go over to Isaiah chapter 14, look what, look what he writes about uh, Satan or Lucifer. He says, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And then verse 15, here's the destruction. You are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Now, we go to the Garden of Eden. Remember Adam and Eve? This is kind of what led to their downfall. They wanted to be like God. So they ate the forbidden fruit. And what happened? It it led to their fall. They were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and they were banished from the presence of God forever. Now you have Satan. Before all of this happens, you have Satan says, he says to God, I'm moving on up. And God says, no, Satan, you're going down. 
you are going down. So God kicked Satan out of heaven, and he's been going down ever since, and one day he's going to end up in the lake of fire for his eternal destruction. The way down is up. The way up is down. Jesus turns it all around for us. Now, you don't find a lot of people asking, how can I be more humble? <laughs> we just don't ask that. We don't show up at, the, at Barnes & Noble and say, hey, can you, can, you, can you show me the way to the humility section? Need some. How to eat crow, right? You don't, you don't find that. That's not, that's not who we are. Uh, we, in today's world, it's all about how do we become more famous? How do I become more successful, more prosperous, more noticed, more prominent? Yet the Bible speaks over and over and over again about this behavior of humility. Humility. In fact, the Bible speaks of humility as a wonderful honor. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains what? Honor. How are you doing with humility? What does it look like to have humility in our lives? I want to give you three characteristics this morning. Kind of wrap this thing up with a nice ribbon, hopefully. Here's the first characteristic, and that is true humility sees yourself as God sees you. True humility allows you to see yourself as God sees you. It's all about your identity. And it's all about finding your proper identity. You may think you're worthless because of how society evaluates you or what your parents say about you or what your husband or wife says about you or what your kids think of you. You might think you're worthless because of this, uh, but I want to tell you, I've said this before, I'll say it again, you cannot and do not let society define who you are. It's not their place. You may be divorced, but that's not your identity. You may be an addict, that's not your identity. You, 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 your shrink may have given you a label. That's not your identity. You may be poor or rich, an alcoholic or sober, ignorant or intelligent, but these things are not your identity. God says that He is your Father and you are His child. You are His son. You are His daughter. That is your identity. That is your identity. Humility is not about having a poor self-image. I don't want you to get that from the message today, that we have to walk around in life like, well, we're just walk-ons and pushovers. That is not humility. Humility is not thinking that you're a worthless wimp. On one hand, we were one-time sinners in need of a Savior, deserving death. And hell. At one time we were that, but now as followers of Jesus Christ, we are children of God. That is our identity. Paul writes in uh, Romans chapter 7 about how he's such a wretched creature because he just cannot refrain from sin. He wants to do good. We all know this struggle. We want to do good, but what happens? We end up doing the bad things instead. And Paul says, I'm a failure. I, I'm a failure. And some of you this morning, you walked in and you feel like a failure. And I think you've gotten your identity a little mixed up. Paul says, I'm a failure. But then in Romans chapter 8, the very next chapter, he writes in the first verse, he says, Therefore, there is now no what? Condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. And then you jump down to verse 17, and because of this, we are what? Come on, say it out loud. We are heirs. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. That is who we are. No one can take that away from us. And if you came in here feeling like a failure this morning... Forget about it. You're not a failure. You are a child of God, and He has forgiven you, and He has given you a rightful place in the eternal kingdom of, of heaven. We're no longer failures. Stop letting the world define who you are. Stop letting your parents define who you are. Stop letting your, your spouse define who you are. Let God define who you are. You are a child of God. Start living as a child of God and rightful heirs of His kingdom, eternal kingdom. Someone once said, God has wisely designed the human body so that you can neither pat yourself on the back nor kick yourself in the seat. Isn't that great? <laughs> I like A.W. Tozer. 
he writes this, A humble man is not a human mouse afflicted with a sense of his own inferiority. He has accepted God's estimate of his own life. He says he knows he is weak and helpless as God declared him to be, but paradoxically, he knows that that at the same time, he is in the sight of God, listen to this, of more importance than the angels. And then he says, in himself, in man, nothing. In God, everything. Proper identity. That's humility. And we can be confident in that. Humility replaces I with Christ. Humility replaces I with Christ. Here's the second one. True humility is revealed by, now this makes sense, how I treat other people. True humility is revealed by how I treat other people. So let me ask, how how do you treat other people? Pride rushes us to get the best seat to the table. Pride rushes us to get to the front of the line so we can eat before anyone else. Pride walks all over people, other people, in order to get our preferences and, and, and met. Pride keeps I at the center of the universe and is constantly looking out for number one. That's pride. Humility, however, replaces I with Christ. Philippians chapter 2, one of my favorite passages in the, in the entire New Testament. Paul writes this. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. How do you treat other people? He says, Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then verse 5, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. You remember the old adage, the old formula, in order, J-O-Y, joy. Remember this? Say it with me. Jesus, others, yourself. Some of you don't remember. <laughs> but in that order, right? Ready? Jesus, others, yourself. And that's the old formula, and it's so true. It starts with Jesus, and it ends with self. Um, the night Jesus was arrested, what did he do? He took on the very nature of a servant. He gets up from the table at the Passover meal. He, take, he wraps a towel around his waist, and he gets a water basin, and he goes around, and he washes his disciples' smelly, dirty old feet. Who wants that job? But that's Jesus. He didn't let pride get in the way. And then later on, he humbles himself and becomes obedient to this criminal's death. A death on a cross, humiliating. And we see this path that Jesus takes, that he keeps going down and down and down and down. What did God do? Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The way down is up and the way up is down. You see it in Jesus' life. Now, I'm, I'm not saying this to say that if you, serve, if you become a servant like Jesus was a servant, that, you're gonna, that people are going to worship you and fall down at your, your feet. All right? But what it does mean is if you serve like Jesus served, it will guarantee you a place in heaven. It'll come with great reward. The way up is down. Martin Luther tells a story of seeing two goats meeting on a path on a mountain ledge. And they can't pass each other because the path is narrow. And instead of butting one another out of the way, one of them lays down and allows the other one to pass over him. Martin Luther says we all need to have goat sense. You got your goat sense on today? We need to have the ability to lie down so that others may be served well. How are you treating other people? How do you treat other people? Let me give you the last characteristic of humility. True humility is refined through adversity. Refined through adversity. Perhaps you've been knocked down a peg or two. What are you supposed to learn out of this? Maybe God's trying to teach you some humility. You go back to the Old Testament and Job. Remember Job? Job learned true humility, didn't he? My goodness, he was knocked down a peg or two. But he recognized God's power through his trials. What a humbling experience. Peter, uh, the apostle Peter, said that even if he had to die with Jesus, he would never turn his back on him. And the night Jesus was arrested, 
Peter learns true humility as he denies his Savior three times. On the third time in the rooster crows, he learns true humility. How about Thomas? Thomas refused to, refused to believe that Jesus had come back from the dead until he saw his wounds and put his hand in the, in, in the mark on his, in his side. And when Jesus showed up, I think Thomas learned true humility. The Apostle Paul defended his Old Testament ways through thick and thin. He was putting Christians to death because they thought, he thought they were wrong. So he's out on his way to Damascus. And you know what? He learns true humility when Jesus shows up and blinds him. And what a path Jesus set him on. Jesus said in Luke 14, 11, once again, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And the Apostle Paul knew that quite well, really well. He knew how privileged he was when God transported him to the third heaven. Remember this in, in 2 Corinthians? Uh, God transports Paul to this third heaven and he sees sights that he couldn't even describe. They were too wonderful to describe to even talk about. And so in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. You see what God does? He allows Paul to suffer some kind of ailment to keep him humble. And I believe God still does that today. Don't you? Oh, man. Some of you are, are going through some rough times right now, and you're wondering, why am I going through this? Maybe God's trying to teach you some humility. There's a minister, Jim Henry, First Baptist Church in Orlando. He tells this story of when his college invited him to receive an award for outstanding alumnus. Wouldn't that be a great award to, to win if you've been to college Outstanding alumnus. So Jim Henry goes to this ceremony dressed in his finest black suit. And he attends this graduation ceremony, and they're outside at Georgetown College in Kentucky. Just before he was called up to receive his award, he began to think about how important he had become. In college, he recalled how nobody really knew who he was, he, if he wasn't studying, if he weren't studying for his exams and, and classes and that kind of thing, he was in the cafeteria working his debt off for school. So he didn't have time to get involved in other activities to really meet, make friends, so nobody really knew who Jim was. So he's sitting on this stage at Georgetown College, and he started thinking to himself, now look at me. They know who I am. They know that I'm somebody. They know who I am today. And he's starting to feel pretty good about himself. And as he's thinking about how good he is, a bird flew overhead. Yeah, you know what happens next. <laughs> sure enough, splat. He's covered in bird droppings on his shoulder. His finest black suit is ruined, of course. And for a moment, he became horrified. Now look at me. And then he kind of started chuckling. He began to laugh as he realized his pride had gotten the best of him. And to this day, he still thinks that God sent that bird to give him a little bit of humility. Probably so. Now, maybe God has been sending birds your way. They've been taking dumps on your shoulder. The world's been taking a dump on your shoulder, and, and it's not great. And you feel absolutely humiliated. Maybe God's trying to teach you some humility. When troubles come, when troubles come, some people look to heaven and they raise their fists and they just get bitter. Other people, when troubles come, they drop to their knees and they pray to God and they get better. Which one are you?